What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. Review. It's our weekly show where we go over the magic stories as they're posted on Wizards website, or as we've been doing in this interim period, the kind of filler Vorthos content that they've been giving us in between. This week, we were reviewing, or are reviewing, the Planeswalker's Guide to Ixalan Part 1, once again, to uh, by the R&D narrative team. If you missed last week's episode, Amy and I were a little upset about last week. This week, I suspect we'll have changed our tone slightly, and my quick review in the beginning is this was a good one. It was nice and short, which we've talked about before should be the norm, because then you don't need all this filler content. You can just make a bunch of short ones. But sorry, we can talk about that once the full review comes along. Quick review, it was a good one. You should go read it before watching this video. As we always say, we review, we do not summarize. You've been nodding your head. Is that fully agree, partially agree with what I've said? Um, my review is that it was good. It's definitely not the same sort of read as a story. That's fair. It's definitely much more textbooky. Yes, and it, it, um, more informative than kind of flowery and descriptive. And right. Yeah. But it was information that hasn't been shoved down our throats a zillion times already, so yes, I liked it. Okay, so yes, that's our quick review. If you have not gotten a chance to go read it, it like I said, it was actually a short one, um, so I highly recommend that you go read it and then come back to this video if you'd like. We would appreciate that. On to the full review itself. Planeswalker's Guide to Ixalan, it's kind of funny. The last Planeswalker's Guide, I mentioned this to Amy before we started reading it, was, if I remember correctly, was the Planeswalker's Guide to Kaladesh. And it was terrible. <laughs> we were not a fan. You can go back and find it. We reviewed it on JAR. And it was bad, because as Amy kind of hinted at, that Planeswalker's Guide just spit back a bunch of information we already had heard two or three times prior. Mm -hmm. Which was annoying, because it was like, I, I didn't come here to just read a recap, you know, yeah. of, of what happened already. I'm here to learn new things. Right, and so, if I wanted the spark notes of the stuff I had already read, why would you want that? Yeah, <laughs> you, would, you would seek it out, and it's, it's in many other forms in many other places, so you don't need wizards to do it for you, to compile that information yeah, for you. Yeah, it's like if you want spark notes, that's fine then just read that one thing instead of everything else. Yes. But. So, but in this case, this was not Spark Notes. This was kind of supplemental information yeah. of historical information about some of the characters that we already knew about, some of the cards in the set, and kind of the origins behind those cards and why they are named that way. But mostly the plane. Yes. The history of the plane itself and... The people, the people who lived there who aren't really characters in any of the stories. Right, so just the, the races or the ancestors of those people. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, just to kind of go through it quickly and, and briefly, again, this is not a, a summary, but to kind of touch on some of the points, it started talking about Itlamok. I really like that card. Right, the, the, the card that flips into the growing rites of Itlamok that's kind of the, um, the fixed Gaia's Cradle. Um, kind of with the tree sprouting up out of the ground with a bunch of people standing around it with magic. And we learned that that was humans and merfolk, or river heralds, working together back before the Sun Empire was a thing and before kind of the conflict between those two groups even began. And that was really cool. Also, that art is cool and reminds me of the, um, what are they called? That, um... Oh, no. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. The things that Nahiri made. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say, um... I don't know. Nope, you say. can let us know what they are in the comments. <laughs> I, I, I know what they are. We've talked about them right. many times. I just don't remember offhand. But yes, the little things of power that were in the, um, like drown the yard. Stone. Yeah. That were in the drown yard, focusing energy to summon Emrakul during the uh, the return to Innistrad storyline. Because Nahiri's badass. <laughs> and because Emrakul's scary. Um, uh, Emrakul's also badass. I yes. Don't know what yours no, was. you're you're right. You're right. I, I didn't say just because she was scary, she wasn't badass. Don't don't you worry. Okay. So, 
but that card, you know what that made me think of, was the fact that there were there was that story a little while ago uh, of the flip card for um, the ship, whose name I'm also now not going to remember. But there was a double-faced, or there is a double-faced card in Ixalan that's a ship, and then it's a, a an outpost of some kind, and it they gave it its own mini story that they released on like a Monday or something, which was fine. It was cool. And they said that they were going to be doing that with flip cards. I haven't seen another one. Have you guys? So following up that flip card story, which was cool. It was a little taste, little brief look into the world of Ixalan, separate and apart from the characters that we've been following in these stories. This, starting with the, the information about Itlamok, was like, oh, okay, so this was just your, your story about the growing rights of Itlamok flip card that you didn't put into its own thing, you just put it into this Planeswalker's Guide, which is not necessarily a critique in and of itself. I just think that it's funny that it very much could have been its own story as one of those flip card stories, and it would have done just as well because it kind of didn't... The, the rest of the, the Planeswalker's Guide didn't necessarily need you to have known the information about Itlamok before being able to understand the rest of it. So it could have been its own separate thing uh, and it would have worked for uh, a story about the flip cards. So I thought that, that was an interesting choice that that is not what happened. <laughs> um, then we move on to learning about the leaders of the Sun Empire. Uh, I'm probably going to pronounce these incorrectly. I've, I'm trying. Uh, but there's no pronunciation guide in the story. But <laughs> it's uh, Chikanto Intley and Apotzak Intley uh, and Apotzak Intley the Third. So we learned about the the incremental leaders of the Sun Empire. The fact that Chikanto uh, was the original one who kind of gathered together all of the fractured city states and brought them together into what we now know as the Sun Empire. But this was prior to clearly the Sun Empire because that's what formed it. Uh, and then when she was gone, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was her immediate successor or at some point later, a Potzak came around. And we've heard about a Potzak before for two reasons. One, it's the name of the emperor who Watley was answering to, but we come to find out that that is this a Potzak's um, descendant, because the one that we've heard about is the third, this one is the original. But we also learned from last week when they um, went through one of the questions that uh, the original Apotzak was the one who wielded the original or the immortal sun and caused all the destruction that we heard yeah. about. Uh, so that was an interesting tie-in. But again, that kind of furthers to go with what we were talking about last week where that little portion of what we learned about last week wasn't necessary to give us last week because then you gave it to us again this week. So that's just kind of going back to how annoying last week was. Go watch the video. Right. I'm not going to reiterate all This week's was good. Yes, exactly. Last so we're, week shouldn't have existed. We're happier. We're happier this week. Last week, not so much. Um, but we, we learned about the, the different Apotzaks. We learned about the different leaders of the emperors and kind of their motivations and... and um, an interesting piece of information that we didn't know because we haven't seen a Potzak since Watley's first story, or Potzak the Third, I should say. Uh, we find out that a Potzak put a lot of resources into finding the Immortal Sun, which is not something that is shown to us at all because I'm pretty sure, like, Watley and her cousin Inti and maybe one or two other people were the only ones that they told us right. were searching for the the uh, for um, uh, Araska and for for the Immortal Sun. So I don't know how that's a lot of resources, right. unless there's more to it that we haven't heard about yet. But it it the reason I bring it up is because I found it interesting because they then said that uh, the people of um, the Sun Empire, some of them are upset now with the decision to have devoted a lot of those resources, which. And because they're saying that they feel like it leaves the cities of the Sun Empire vulnerable to attack from other outside enemies, even though, I guess, you know... And all of those other outside enemies are just showing up now because... Well, they didn't say that. They just said that that's what they're afraid of. 
Right. But still, that's I mean, really... have to say that. We right. know it's true. Well, and that's very interesting to me because that in and of itself, that would make for a good story or or would make for a good end of the story where Watley gets back from looking for the immortal sun. Maybe she has it, maybe she doesn't, whatever the case may be. But she comes back and the cities are being attacked or already destroyed or whatever. And then having to kind of have to deal with that from there. I think that that would be kind of interesting. So we got information about that. We also then got information on sun worship and the different ways that the sun was being worshipped. Now, I referenced the Planeswalker's Guide to Kaladesh and how annoyed we were about it. And that's because they talked about the ether cycle in the Planeswalker's Guide to Kaladesh. And I know that it was the ether cycle because I heard about it three different ways leading up to it. Like I said, we heard it many, many times. And it talked about, you know, which races were part of which portion of the ether cycle and all these other things. We heard that a million times, that it was five parts because there are five colors of mana. And so it's, you know, it's the, the creation and then etc. And I, I'm not going to be able to list them all, although if I thought about it, I probably could. But this told us about sun worship. And it was very similar to me, at least it made me think of that experience, because it, it talked about uh, the creative sun, which is based on the white mana, the sustaining and nourishing sun, based on the green mana, and the destructive sun, based on the red mana. Those are the three colors of the sun empire, and they are the three colors of the sun worship, or at least the, the kind of the properties that they see in the sun. That's fascinating. Yes. I liked that. That's a very cool characterization of this, this empire and what they worship and why, right? That's information that we did not have before today. Right. And the other thing is, while you probably could have gleaned this information from reading enough of the stories and stuff, they say that you have, I'm going to read this because otherwise I won't remember, you have Kinjali, the Wakening Sun, which is in relation to the white mana. You have Ixali, the Verdant Sun, which is in relation to the green mana, and you have Tilanali, the Burning Sun, in relation to the red mana. The reason that I bring that up is because, if you're aware of Ixalan at all, there are many cards that reference this. Tilanali's Skin Shifter, Ixali's Diviner, right? Um, Kinjali Sun Caller, th things like that. You have a lot of different um, creatures and, and, and cards in and of themselves that reference these entities or these different kinds of suns. You also have the Wakening Suns, Verdant Suns, and Burning Suns avatars in the dinosaurs that are somewhat, as we learned, controlled by the Sun Empire. And by we learned, I mean we've kind of seen it in practice, but... So, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm just kind of lecturing at this point. Do it's you okay. do you have feelings or opinions on on that? I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, I stuff. liked it a lot, but I don't really have any expansive things to say about it. Fair enough. It was just it was there. It was information that was given to us, yeah, and it was information I'm, that we didn't have going in. Yeah, I'm happy that they gave it to us. Um, it kind of sucks because that means that we know that it's maybe not going to come into play too much when the next set of stories comes around. Oh, don't you worry. I'll be talking about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's move on. <laughs> okay. So we learned about the, that in relation to the Sun Empire, and I thought that, that was great. Then we move on to the River Heralds of the Merfolk. Now, what I thought was interesting was we, we learned a little bit about the Merfolk, but in my opinion, and this may just be my opinion, um... A lot of the stuff that they told us about the merfolk, we'd kind of already been told in Kapala's story. It was not as offensive, in my opinion, as some of the repetitiveness from the stories from this set have been in the past. Well, because it made it, sense to have that information in this story. Right. Because it listed all the information about everything else as well. Yeah, I was just going to say they peppered in new stuff within all of that. So while it was arguably repetitive, it was not glaringly or boringly so, again, in, in our opinions. You always, as always, let us know what, what if you agree or disagree. But um, it, it, was, it was still fine. 
right? The information was still nice, and we learned the names of the other nine, uh, or of all nine, I guess, tributaries that uh, kind of blend into the river, which, as we learned, is how Kapala, Kumena, and Tishana, for example, got their names because they are named as the leaders uh, out of those different tributaries and stuff. Which is cool. That's a really interesting um, story point. I liked that. And we got the other names that, of course, I'm not going to remember unless maybe in the next set we see them. I'm, I'm assuming we'll see Kumena since he has been named at this point as a card, but maybe we see the other ones, maybe we don't. Maybe we simply see something like Ixali's Diviner, which is a random creature. Maybe we will see, you know, name of tributary, apostrophe S's, whatever, you know, Guardian or something like that. So you're not necessarily, it's not necessarily a legendary creature with a name, but it could still reference them, and now we will know what it's talking about, which is nice. What I will point out, and as I said, it was kind of... Uh, by the way, this ended then with saying, you know, check out the, the art of Magic the Gathering Ixalan coming out in January. Which, we don't work for wizards, but right. from what we've seen of these art books, it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Um, so if you get the chance, definitely go pick them up. If you're watching this show, you probably already have decided whether or not you're going to, but regardless. <laughs> but the last thing I wanted to talk about kind of overarchingly was the kind of the concept of this article. And we kind of talked about it last week, but I was it was kind of with a little bit more anger behind it or or frustration. I don't want to say anger, but frustration behind it because last week's article was very annoying. This week's was good. It was informative and it was nice. But we just came from Amon Ket. And so maybe I'm spoiled. But Amon Ket, I thought, and this is purely my opinion. I'm obviously going to ask for Amy's and I want yours as always. After coming from Amonkhet, Amonkhet was so rich in, in its world building. We knew everything about Amonkhet. We knew about the trials and the fact that it was all children and there were no adults because Bolas messed all that up. And we learned about them going through the trials and being willing or happy to die in this process because of their worship of the gods, and how they felt when the gods were around and things like that. I didn't need, nor do I believe we got, a Planeswalker's Guide to Amonkhet to understand all of that and be able to reiterate it to all of you right now, because the stories were good enough to have shown that to us from start to finish. Yes, but I think you also have to realize that that was Amonkhet. That was <clears throat> the plane that Bolas... I shouldn't say built. No, but he, he but, built in his image. Right. Yeah. He But he distorted it to yes. a point of being basically the builder of it. Yes. And that's a lot more important in the scheme of things, probably, than Ixalan is. That's true, but I still feel like uh, in reading this information, what I got out of it was that the story team or the narrative team made this whole world and that this is the only way they get to show it to us is through the Planeswalker's Guide and through the art book. I guess that's fine because to a degree you need something to sell the art book, right? Because if it is all just, as we've talked about and been frustrated about, if it is all just reiteration of the stuff that we read online for free, then why purchase it? Why spend money on the art book when it comes out? But I also feel like they're doing themselves a disservice. Obviously, I can't speak for them, and I don't know how they feel about it, but I feel like that's doing themselves a disservice because they worked so hard to put together all this information, to build this backstory for the River Heralds, for the Sun Empire, for the the Dusk Legion, who we heard very little about in this, although we still have next week. And the Brazen Coalition, who we also barely heard about, but there's also next week right. for part two. But with all of that world building, this filler 
Because that's all that it is at the end of the day, unfortunately, because it is not a main set story. So it kind of default falls into the filler category, which is not a place that you want to be in, yeah. at least based on where where the filler category has, or what I should say, has been in the filler category recently. Mm -hmm. That's not worthy of the amount of work that had to have gone in to this world building, to this history. Because as we pointed out, it was very good. As hopefully you thought, it was very good hearing all this information and learning all these things and kind of being more connected to what is happening now on the plane. I, and this is purely my opinion, I want to be shown that. I don't want to be told that, like Amy said, in a textbook format. That's my personal opinion. Maybe you guys think differently and you loved this because you're like, just give me all the information. I just want it all. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. That is not, I'm not saying that you're wrong for liking it that way. It's just my personal preference that I enjoy being shown those things. And that's why I bring up the example of Amon Ket. Because I thought Amon Ket was done in such a, they, they did such a good job with that on Amon Ket that it, it kind of, like, Amy looked at me. There was a lot more eloquence to it than and, this method. Right. And, and I have a, a theory as to why it worked then but not now. But I will say Amy looked at me at one point during this article, or the, you know, this article today, and she said to me, you know, this is really good. And you're not wrong. But at the same time, I didn't fully agree with you. The information is good. <clears throat> it, yes, because it's interesting. Yes, and it's information that we didn't have already, and it's information that we wanted to know, basically, about these people and this place. Yes. Um, but it kind of stinks that this is the only way we get to know it. Yes, and that's, that's my problem with it. Has nothing to do with the information, because again... It's, it clearly shows that the narrative team worked really hard on this stuff. And I, I have to respect that. Yes. Because I don't know that I could have gone this in depth. Maybe I could have, right? I don't know. I haven't tried. But <laughs> they worked so hard on putting all this stuff together. And it's so rich and informative. I just personally wish if it were a narrative that it were given to me in a narrative way. And it were shown in that way. And it wasn't. And that's, it, for me, that was a little bit of a letdown. It didn't make any of the information any less interesting or pertinent, but it kind of it, it kind of stunk a little for me to have to read it that way, as opposed to hearing Watley talk about it or hearing Apotzek talk about it. You know, at, give us another Apotzek story. And that's, I think, where, I, I brought it up earlier, that's, I think, where <clears throat> those short stories would help. You won't need filler content if you give us a bunch of short stuff. So yeah. give us a potzek talking to someone, um, whether it be Watley, whether it be a child who comes up to talk to him. And so he's really just giving us what we already got, but maybe you throw in some, uh, some information from the child of, you know, whatever. This it's, I'm just spitballing here, right? Coming up with something. P.S. This is something that Allison Lors has specifically said that she's particularly good at in terms of uh, just the way that she writes. Yes, two people standing talking to each other and, and making that interesting. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and so I, I find it kind of ironic and maybe sad that it couldn't go that way and it, and it went this way instead when... Allison Lors is basically the only one we know for sure at this point is actually still on the story team. Well, and the interesting <laughs> right, and the interesting thing is, well, the, I I do want to correct. I think they're solely going by narrative team now. That's I tried to correct myself. I don't know. Whatever they they identify themselves as the narrative team, so I wanna I wanna try to call them by the right thing, because um, I think it's different now. I I don't. Whatever. Know. Yeah, exactly. I don't I, care. Uh, well, I, I'm just trying to be nice if, if that's the case. But so that kind of stunk a little bit. But to go back to the Amonkhet example, because I promised I would, I would give reasoning behind it, or at least what I think. 
<clears throat> on Amonkhet, you had five Gatewatch planeswalkers coming into this plane that they had never been to before. So there was a reason for all of them to have learned about yes. the society of Amonkhet. Mm -hmm. In this plane, or on this plane, you have two planeswalkers. Technically Angraf, but he hasn't had a story yet. But right. otherwise, you have Veraska and you have Jace. And we will see next week, because if my assumption is correct, this week we got Sun Empire and uh, River Heralds. Next week we will get Brazen Coalition and Dusk uh, Legion. That's just my assumption. I don't know that. But that's just it, two and two. It just kind of makes sense. Um, if that's the case, I'm curious to see what information we glean about the Brazen Coalition, because that would be the only information that we would have learned through Veraska and Jace's stories, because that's the only race that they know a lot about, and then arguably some of the Dusk Legion, because that's who they've been actively fighting in the stories that we've seen. So, because on Amonkhet, the characters that we were kind of following, at least in the beginning, didn't understand the society, the culture, etc. They needed to learn it. And so we learned it along with them. Yeah. There aren't really characters for us to do that with in, on Ixalan. So that's the only thing I can come up I, with for... I still think Jay... I mean, well, I mean, Jace is trying to learn more about himself at this point. That's correct. <laughs> he would. He would want to learn a lot, and maybe he will come rivals of Ixalan now that he's got his memories back, so he might be a little bit more himself. But we don't fully know. I mean, it may just be straight conflict the whole time with, you know, the Dusk Legion and, and kind of all four groups coming together in the search for Araska and, and the search for the Immortal Sun. And so I don't know if Jace will have enough time to breathe. And when he does, I assume it's going to be to handle his nonsense with Varaska first. Yeah. I think it'd be nice to have like a little fun story about Varaska, sort of the time in between uh, Bolus's invitation and this. For her you know? finding Jace. Yeah, like her kind of coming into her own as the captain a little bit. Well, more. I was going to say she well, they kind of She kind of told us that in that. terms of like her looking for her crew and stuff, yeah. but but no, I I still think that's a fair like they could do that. I don't know that I necessarily would want that, but I also don't know that I would hate it if it happened. So yeah. I mean, that's that's another opportunity for them to throw breaches in there since everybody loved that little asshole. Ugh. Oh my god, him. you're pissing so many people off. Good, I don't <laughs> care. I hate him. Uh, I have no strong opinions either way. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't. Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please don't look at me. Um, so, that is kind of my frustration with this article, because it was not a story, it was an article. And especially because the the... I was kind of entrenched as if it were a story until they started talking about the different worship, worship, sun worships. I couldn't think of the way to word that properly, sorry. The different sun worships that the Sun Empire does. And then in parentheses had like, this is white mana. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then, yes, that's what made me feel like, like Amy said, that's what made me feel like it was a textbook as opposed to up until that point, it could have been an elder right, from one of the Ixalan cities kind like of telling us, it. yes, <laughs> and that's kind of how I read it at first, until they were like, this is white mana, and I was like, oh, damn it, you know, like that, <laughs> that kind of, it took me out of it, yeah, and so that's why I got, I, I say that it was, it was a little disheartening, because it takes you out of being in Ixalan and puts you in player mode, yes, or, or in, in like analysis mode of like oh right okay white mana and that means this and then you you know you started talking about what other people uh, or characters from past stories were kind of akin to the other colors and the kind of the purposes behind it which is fine right that's kind of something that we usually do in these seats but it's the kind of thing that I shouldn't be thinking about Amonkhet people or something like story. that while reading about Ixalan unless there is some clear delineation where it talks about the two. Yeah, because really all that means is that 
you hold them in higher regard than any of the information that you're actually learning from the story that you're reading now. So it... Like, oh, I'll... I'll compare it to these people who I already know and actually care about. <laughs> yes. So, I, I still believe what I said at the beginning, which is that this story was good, or sorry, this article was good. It was informative. It told us things we didn't know, and it kind of tied up a lot of loose threads or loose ends or whatever. Definitely. In, in regards to some information that we weren't fully clear on, but also in terms of names of some of the cards and the reasoning behind some of those names. That's really cool to know. Again, I it's... I liked how thorough it was, for sure. Yes. But um, and I don't mind the textbookiness of it like you do quite yeah. as much. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I like history, so, uh, you know, read me a textbook and I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, but it is very different, and it's, it is kind of disappointing to know that we're not going to get the kind of storytelling that we got um, from Amonkhet and, um, yeah. And I will just throw this out there, I'm not going to fully analyze it, we've talked about it in the jar before and many of you probably already know it exists, but I think that may be, I, I hope that it is not the price that we pay for the narrative team breaking up the gay watch like that. Yeah. <clears throat> because, pardon my voice, because that's what was asked for, that's what was given to us, and now we're here and we're like, why isn't the story telling us this stuff? And it's yeah. like, well, because we don't have new, we don't have new people to follow along to learn about the plane. So it has to be told to us in this way. Right. And like I said, I hope that's not immediately the case, but that's something for you guys to think about, to talk about in the comments. We can talk to yes, you guys about it later. Yes, do. And if you have, like, um, if you have suggestions of a great way to sort of accomplish all of those things without the negatives, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear those for sure. Yeah. So that's going to be another episode of Jar. It was, this was good, right? It was a, a million percent better than last week for sure, um, but it still had a little bit of work to do. We will be back next week for what I can only imagine. I don't know for sure, as I always say, but what I can only imagine is the Planeswalker's Guide to Ixalan Part 2. Uh, but this has been Jar on Geek for All. We care about these stories, and that's us, hopefully with you, showing off our... Hashtag Vorthos Pride, guys. That's right. Again, I've been Joe. Uh, I'm Amy. Feel free to subscribe, click on the videos, do all that fun stuff. And as we always say, in whichever video of ours you watch next, we will see you all next time. Thanks so much, everybody.